Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse standout Raphael Addison. Addison played at Syracuse from 1982 to 1986, and when he finished his career, he ranked number two in career scoring behind only the legendary Dave Bing. I talked with Raph about his Syracuse career, his memories of teammate Pearl Washington, and being a rookie on a Phoenix Suns team with veteran players doing cocaine. How you doing, Raph? Great, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, before we started recording, you and I were having a little fun just kind of catching up with each other. And um, it was on my list of things to mention, and you brought it up before I could. Uh, you were now, I think, 10th all time on SU's scoring list. Uh, you were second when you, your career ended at SU, but now you're 10th. But everybody ahead of you got to play with the three-point shot. You didn't get to play with a three-pointer, and from what I understand, it might have helped. <laughs> I think so. But, you know, everybody that's on their scoring list will have a, a story. So, you know, th that's, that was our time, and we dealt with it. I mean, Dave Bing played three years. Right. He couldn't play varsity. He got, he got that excuse. I, I couldn't play varsity as a freshman. And I and I didn't have the three point line. He didn't have the three point line either. So he even got a bigger case than me. <laughs> but I think it's good to bring it up because I think at this point, uh, whatever we are, thirty five years uh, since your career ended up here, uh, that, that sometimes it's easy to forget uh, the accomplishments of guys from your era and even be, uh, before you. Um, Eighteen hundred points in four years with no three pointer, and uh, it was just a remarkable career you had here. I was wondering. How did you end up at SU? I know you're, you're from Jersey City and, and went to right. Snyder High School down there in Jersey City, which isn't a noted mm -hmm. basketball power. Um, you know, there's a lot of other high schools down there in Jersey that, that you know, we were aware of for producing lots of guys. So how did you end up at SU? Well, the people know uh, St. Anthony's with Bob Hurley down from Jersey City. They, they, they're more familiar with that. And maybe Hudson Catholic right now. And, it's, and then they remember Michael Corrin and Jeff Benalco. They played a Hudson Catholic too, for you know the Duke guy and the North Carolina guy. So I ended up at SU because, first of all, first of all, let's, let me just say it was my dream school. Right. And and I never thought I would have an opportunity uh, to go there, but I went out to, went out to five star and uh, and played really well. You know, led the campus scoring, and Brendan Malone came out the next week to five star and the coach I had was telling him about me. And on the hunch, the hunch from that coach and the respect they had for each other, he went after me. He went after me and got coach involved. And, and from there on, it was like a match in heaven. You know, I, you know I, I, I took my business. I went down to NC State with Alvano and Virginia Tech. And, you know, I was looking at the kids, St. John's and places like that. But uh, I always wanted to go to Syracuse. Wow, you were recruited by Jim Valvano. Yeah, and I always tell a story when he came into the house. And my sister goes, Ma, he looks just like Joe Namath. So I laughed about that. I, I, I still remember that remark. So it was, it, was, it was a good time. And the visit was real nice down in North Carolina. Why was Syracuse your dream school? Why, did, why was it, uh, you know, above all those others? Well, you know, I, Notre Dame, I didn't like the atmosphere. I, didn't, I, I had to go somewhere where I felt like I would fit in. Now, before, you know, before Patrick and Chris Mullen and all those guys, there was some other guys in the Big East uh, when it first started that I was watching. You know, like, I, I love uh, watching Red Bruin, who could jump off of two feet better than anybody. Like people don't remember people people can't remember the times he could jump over Patrick Ewing, but they remember Patrick Ewing blocking all the shots in the finals against North Carolina. Red would jump right over him. Then I was watching Eric Sanifor, silky smooth, scoring on the baseline against anybody. Then I watched this guy Leo Routens, like six eight, throwing passes. And then I then you then you go down to St. John's and they had this kid named David Russell, a lefty that could jump out the gym. And, you know, and they, they, they had some they had some guys that could really play. And of the errors, forget about those guys. But I saw those guys and said, you know what? Uh, hey, yo, I want to do some of the things they're doing. And, and you got to remember, TV wasn't what it is today. 
-hmm. you know, those guys were the stepping stones for the guys like me and Pearl and Derek Coleman and, and those guys moving on to bigger and better things. But they started that thing because, you know, and, and people don't remember, like, the battles that a guy like Andre Hawkins had with Ewan. Now, I would say this, and, and I'll put my money on this. I've never seen a center 6'7", maybe 6'7", in high heels, cover people back better than Andre Hawkins. He took charges better than any center, I think, in the Big East. Like, he, he, he covered your back, did a lot of the dirty stuff that people never, ever talk about. Really? That's cool. What was Jim Beheim like to play for, and how, how was he with you? Oh, we, I don't think we ever had an argument, but he was very intense. Like, now, you got to remember, I came up to 82, so that's going back like 38 years. He was in his late 30s at that time. So he used to get on the court with us. And then you, you could tell that he was competitive because he'll show you how to backdoor. He'll show you how to ball side cut. And he'd get out there and do it. So you would say, whoa, this guy, you know, you could tell he used, he used to play the game. I, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine now, but he, he would be actually be out there on the floor with, with you guys, huh? Dem demonstrate. But you got to remember, he was in his 30s then. I yeah. mean, he was probably a year or two older than LeBron. So he, he, he was out there demonstrating, and you could see the smarts, uh, the, 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 the IQ, and you, you could see, like, oh, whoa, back in that time, you know, he can, you know, coach could play. He could also uh, get a little excited on the bench. I, I've seen, like, you know, Ooh. film clips and stuff of him getting on referees. and. Well, uh, I think do, I think we got some of the worst of that. Like, I think now he really mellowed out. Like, you know, <laughs> back, back when I was there, was, well, he, he, would go, he would go off. He was, he was a lot more intense. I think he really mellowed, mellowed out. And I think a lot of that comes from um, – you know, his, his wonderful wife, he really mellowed out. From the, so, so some of the guys didn't get what, I, what we got. Who so got it worse in, in your career there? Who among your teammates used to get it worse? I would say Wendell Alexis. I mean, he, he, and, and, that, and, and that was in a good way. Like, he, because he saw Wendell's potential. He saw the talent. This guy could do everything, and, and, and he saw Wendell had, like, a, a, a mellow personality. Wendell was a tough guy, but he had a mellow personality, and Beheim used to – he was hard on Wendell, I think, more than anybody I saw during my, my time there. You know, you, you played with Pearl uh, all three of Pearl's years. That was your sophomore through senior seasons with Pearl. Um, what was it like to have uh, a guy like Pearl on the court with you and as a teammate? Well, first of all, on the court, it was, it was, it was wonderful because we, we clicked right away, you know. And, and I always say it's, it's, it's about five guys in SU history that under any circumstances could have come to Syracuse and started right away. It's about, I mean, I, I would say five. I mean, some, some people came to Syracuse and the situation was great for them. And nobody was in their position. They didn't have to fight off. Pearl was one of those guys, and I can name the other ones easily, uh, that could come in any situation, any era, and start. And he was one of those, he was one of those guys. He was one of those guys. So on the court, it was great because I'm more of an enigma. I'm more anonymous, and he's more flashy and, 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 and loved that attention. I, I hated it. So opposites attract. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So were you guys buds? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, I I I talk more with him probably than anybody on the team. Him and him and Wendell Alexis to anybody on the team yeah. uh, over the years, and even after you know we finished. I mean, we were helping him and me and him as rookies at the rookie pre draft. Um, uh, we was down in uh, Texas. I remember when he came out to Phoenix, the Nets, and, you know, we in Phoenix, and Pearl wanted to go to eat. I said, come on, what you want? You know what he said? Let's go for Chinese food. Pearl, you don't eat Chinese food in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> you don't eat Chinese food. It's not the best. <laughs> so, wow, I couldn't believe that. He wanted to go for Chinese food. <laughs> That's awesome. That was funny. Now, I heard, yeah. you know, to play with him and to travel, you know, go to New York, go to Madison Square Garden with Pearl Washington was like, was like uh, 
traveling with a rock star, right? I mean, he was a legend. Uh, was, and, and he loved it, and everybody knew him. And um, that's when he was his, at his best. Like, you know, but, but see, he, he had a special way of feeling the people. He loved people. He loved, he, you know, he loved, he loved, he wanted validation. He loved, he loved people. And, and that's when he was at his best. And he was, he was flashy and everybody knew him. And, and, you know, I watched him in high school when we was at Brandeis High School. He was with the Gauchos. I saw Pearl came in just as the game was starting. He played. I think he scored 50 points on all layups. And so when the game was over, everybody was around him, everybody was going crazy, he left. Just, just like that. He just, he fills you up, gets you ready, gets you pumped, and then it's gone. So, but, but then you'd be dying for more. You'd be dying for more. So Did that's, you that's ever cool. play against him, like on a playground or an AAU or even high school? No. No, actually, actually we played Riverside Church, and Pearl was playing the game after and me, Wendell, and Pearl was at an ABCD camp in New York back in. Mark Jackson was there. All the Metropolitan guys were there. That's like one of the first ABCD camps mm -hmm. that came out. And we saw Pearl there. But we never knew, we, the three of us, me, him, and Wendell, we never knew we was going to be teammates at that time, at that particular time. Wow. That's cool. Right. Is, uh, you know, Pearl gave us so many memories on the floor when he played at Syracuse. There's the half court shot against Boston College. There was the game winning shot at the Dome against Georgetown. I think there was uh, the, the, the time in the Big East tournament where he just, you know, against Georgetown where he just took them apart. Um, there was the time where he and Patrick Ewing got into it at the Garden. Mm, yes. What's your favorite Pearl memory? You know, that's tough. It's so many. It's so many. But I, I, I got to say the Boston College because I really blame myself for being in that situation. I thought we had that game under control. And coach is really on you about rebounding your side from the zone and stuff like that. And, it, and I think it was my side when Martin Clark got the rebound to go to the foul line before he missed, before we had the opportunity. So he really saved me. He really saved me that, that, at, at that time when he hit that shot. And, of course, it was, a, it was an incredible shot. Only he could do something like that at the time. But that, I never seen the um, dome so electric, so electric. Everybody just just jumping. I mean, I'm jumping. I'm jumping. My man Robert Dixon got like, I didn't know, I didn't, at that time, I, Robert Dixon had a 50 inch vertical jump that day. 50 inch vertical jump when he when Pearl hit that shot. So that, that, that meant a lot to me because I felt like once we start watching tape of the game, it's going to leak out. That, and, and, and Coach told me, uh, you better thank your buddy. He saved you. Coach <laughs> told me that. <laughs> yeah, Coach told me that, yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, you know, when your career ended, you, you went um, second round pick to the Phoenix Suns. And you know, I don't know how many people remember this, but Phoenix was a tough place to send a rookie such as yourself because there were some guys on the Phoenix roster that year that, that, that had a cocaine problems. And then they were, you know, maybe some of them didn't actually have, you know, quote unquote, a problem. Some were addicted, some were just using. But that had to be a difficult situation to be just tossed into it as a rookie yes yes but you know i i i, I hung out with jeff harnesek and kenny gaddison yep. other rookies and i had no idea what was going on and you gotta remember i'm out in i'm out west leaving syracuse and it was, it was starting over again so it, it it was hurtful in terms of not knowing and and, and this young kid is into this big world but you know, your coaches at Syracuse taught you well, your parents taught you well, and you, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, right from wrong. So it was a tough situation. And then the coach getting fired that drafted you. And it was, it was difficult. It was difficult to see that things happen, but, but, you know, it was a wake up call. You know, this, this is the, this is the world we in. You went to Europe after your rookie year. Absolutely. But My you made choice. It to the NBA, which is not an easy thing to do. It, it doesn't always happen for guys. Once, a lot of times, once you go to Europe, you spend your rest of your professional career in Europe. But you made it back to the NBA uh, after being overseas for a few years. 
actually, Mike, I made it back twice to the NBA. Uh, so I went over there. Um, I went over there with the thinking I'm going to be back in the NBA in a year or two because I was still under contract with Phoenix. I was on the suspension list. They released me, I believe I told was something when they signed Tom Chambers from Seattle to an offer sheet. It was, it was freeing up salary. I saw in the paper over there through the wire that I was released. So now I can go back in one year It's because I didn't want to be there in Phoenix. Oh, okay. You didn't. Yeah. But I, but yeah, I wanted to, after the two years was up on my deal, I could have went back and went, tried out for anybody. But once I saw that I was released, I had an opportunity to go back immediately, but I, I, I fell in love with Europe. You know, I, I, cause like I said, I, that's my personality. I'm anonymous. Mm -hmm. I'm an enigma. So that was perfect for a person like me. Stats away on the Mediterranean Sea, playing once a week, fresh seafood, uh, making good money. Actually, my money there was better than what I was making as a rookie. So I was, I, it was perfect for me. It was perfect for me. Yeah, absolutely. Not a bad gig. Yeah. Not bad. So, but you did make yeah, it. Yeah, you came back. Right. Right. Um, and I was strictly, it was two reasons I, I, I came back. And one was my mom was, uh, was getting sick and, and I, was, I lost a lot of time, you know, being with my mom. She passed away uh, probably right after my second, right during, she got sick really during my second year with the Nets. And then she passed away that September. Okay. Uh, uh, during my second year. So that was one reason I came back. And the other reason was I knew that in order to be eligible for an NBA pension, you have to have three years, mm. at least three years. So I was looking at a business thing even back then. Cause I didn't want basketball to use me. You know, I did not want, I, I wanted to use basketball to my advantage. So I was looking at stuff like that because I knew one day you're going to have to transition out of basketball. You have to transition. I knew that. And I, and coming from where I came from, I always knew that. And I always kept that in the back of my mind, the transition uh, once basketball was over. And, and I always tell the kids today, um, the shortest time in your life, if you live long enough, is your childhood. You know what I mean? If you live long enough, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna outdo that three or four times, your childhood. But, but that's where you learn the most from being an adult. And that's the best times of your life. So once those young years was over, I knew it was coming. You, you, you played in the NBA, I think it was a, a, grand, a total of six years, and plus all the years you also played pro ball in Europe. But when, when basketball ended for you, did you know what you wanted to do? Well, I knew I wanted to work for humanity. I knew I wanted to work with kids. So I, I set out a plan. Um, you know, I set out a plan. I started dipping and dabbing with different things, you know, because I did, I did internships with the NBA before I got out the league. You know, I did Century 21 real estate. I did certain things like that because I was preparing. I was preparing for the transition. And while I was doing real estate and stuff like that, I was studying for my teaching certificate. So I could, um, you know, I thought, I was thinking like, what better example for kids showing athletes that you are a student athlete. Now I did the basketball part. Now like, I do the student part. Now I become a teacher. So I was looking at it from that point of view, like, uh, you know, I wanted to set an example as a student athlete to show kids that coming from my environment, coming from a single parent home, you can still make it. You can still do it. No excuses. And you, you basically, you've had a very, very long career as an educator. You, you've been in uh, secondary education for what? The last uh, 25, 30 years, correct? 20, 20 years. Wow. 20 years. I started, I started in 2000. And I retired from the ball in 98. Okay. And, and, and you went back home. And I went back home to the same neighborhood because, you know, I see, you know, a lot of those kids need hope. They need, you, you need, they need to see somebody that looks like them, that come from the public school situation, that come from that, 
you know, I, I said, it's no excuses. You, you know, you know, a lot of those kids have, have, have serious problems. You don't know, you know, they, they at risk kids. You don't know what they going through when they go home. So, I, you know, I, I'm an ear for them. I know I can understand them. Um, and I went through that system, through the recreation programs, uh, grew up, you know, tough, grew up tough, you know, single parent home, like I said. Um, so I understand them. And it's, it's like, it's like giving back on another level. Sure. It, may, it must be rewarding at times when you feel like you have connected with the kid or, or help them, uh, you know, achieve what they can. When obviously for many of the kids that you work with, it's not always easy to get there. It's not always easy to achieve. Absolutely. But I, right now I'm dealing with about probably, I probably got 10, 12 kids that I had their parents. <laughs> You know, I had the parents. So, you know, it, it, the transition is getting better because I had the parents and their kids are here. And, and then, and then um, when you see kids come back, especially the ones that come back, they're in college or successful. It's, it's, it's a great, it's, it, it's a great feel, great reward, great reward. That, 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 that would have to be really special uh, to see a kid that you worked with when they were young walk away with a college degree or something or or if you see them out and about in Jersey City somewhere and you see them doing well, you know, working a job? Absolutely. Some, one, of them, one of them had a kid that was in school, but he was working a graveyard ship at the um, post office. So he would come after getting off, bringing his kid to school, tired, and he said, Mr. Addison, you know, I didn't know it was going to be this tough. I said, yeah, it's tough, but you tougher. You're going to see, now you understand. Everything I was saying, you understand. Mm -hmm. so it's tough you know um it was tough to a, a few years back when we lost pearl and you know we talked earlier here about how close you guys were and everything but um i just remember the outpouring of uh you know love for him it was amazing and i remember the funeral at that big mega church in brooklyn and all the basketball royalty that turned out uh, you know, Kenny Smith was there. Chris Mullen was there. Lou Carnesecca was there. You know, of course, all the Syracuse contingent was there. But I, I don't think I was fully prepared to see all the, you know, the basketball royalty. Ed Pinkney, the the villain. Lloyd Free, right? The great Lloyd, the great Lloyd Free was there. You know, that had to be hard though, uh, for you. I mean, and you might, do you still think about Pearl? Every day, because. Yeah. He died, you know, he died so young. And I was with him a lot at the, in his last days, you know, before he had the surgery. Uh, I, went, I went over to his house in um, Manhattan. And that day he got up, we talked. We had a nice talk that day when I went over um, to see him Sunday morning. And I actually was with him in the hospital and I helped put him in the ambulance to go to the hospice. So I was, you know, it was tough. It was tough. And it's tough for a lot of people. But, you know, he's he, he going to be missed. I tell you what, he's missed, but he's also remembered, uh, which, you know, is just a testimony to what he was like, not only as a player, but as a person. Because I didn't cover Pearl, uh, but I got to know him after the playing career. Yeah. And... He was the most genuine, sweet, humble superstar you could ever meet. And I think that's like part of his legacy as well. And, and that's why I think he's just made such a lasting, uh, you know, legacy here at Syracuse, which I think is awesome. He, he, absolutely. He loves Syracuse. He loved people. Um, he always wanted to please people. He mm -hmm. always wanted, and, 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 he, and he's so humble, so humble. You know, humble, you know, and we, we laugh, we laugh, you know, we, we, we had memories of laugh, you know, we worked the camp up, we worked, worked, worked up, worked the camp up there at Syracuse, and we, we ate lunch and dinner, so some of the, those things you really, you really appreciate now, that's why I tell everybody, you know, we, Sonny Sparrow and all, the Gene Walton, and all the guys trying to get together, because tomorrow's not promised, you, you know, you, you don't know, you just don't know, 
So you got you know you got to treasure your friends and your teammates because the, you know, everybody that you talk to from Syracuse, I guarantee you, ninety nine percent of them will say the best four years of their life was Syracuse. <laughs> was Syracuse. I bet you ninety nine percent will say that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what's great is is that not only did you have a great four years at Syracuse, but what you've done since, and especially in your role as an educator over the last twenty years, is a you know, you know, you're leaving a mark as well, uh, pal. And 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 you did here at Syracuse, and we talked about the the career points and all the scoring and everything. But um, they they can't measure up to everything else you've done in your life. And I, it's it's just a pleasure to have you on the podcast and get a chance to catch up. Uh, Mike, I appreciate it. I have my serenity. You know, I have my you know I, I persevered through a lot, but um, I have my serenity. I'm at peace. At you know the things I did at Syracuse, I'm, I'm at peace with what I'm doing with the school system, mm-hmm. and I still can be anonymous and and just enjoy life. That's fantastic. Listen, Raph, I, th- I appreciate you very much for coming on the podcast. I hope to see you in person real, real soon. Hey, Mike, I just want to give you one story about Coach. I'm still recording. Okay, me and me and Pearl. And it goes with me and Pearl. Me and Pearl used to love the, the soap, All My Children. It was, on, it was on ABC, 1 o'clock. So three incidents happened with that. Once we was in Boston um, playing Boston College, but me and Pearl watching the soaps, we watch it all the time, every day. And that's when you, we remember clearly because the space shuttle blew up and they broke into the show. Mm-hmm. So that's how I remember. And once... Me and Pearl was in the locker room. We got a big game, like in St. John's, Georgetown. We watching all my children in, in, inside the training room. Coaches are going to watch where, where these guys at. He run, coach comes into the lock, I mean, to the training room and ripped a hole in us. He's talking about intensity, ripped a hole in me and Pearl. And me and Pearl chuckled and ran out to the court. But we was watching all my children because they had the African-American couple, Jesse and Angie who was Debbie Morgan, was the first <laughs> super couple on daytime TV, African-American. <laughs> so, man, so Coach ripped us. I'm talking about, and, and he don't, he, we love this show. We, we love this show. Then we get down to LaGuardia playing, I guess we playing St. John's or whatever. Guess who me and Pearl run into at the airport, at the baggage claim? Yeah. Debbie Morgan from oh. All My Children. Wendell goes, Raph, Pearl, your girl's over there. So, so that that that's the story about all my children and Coach ripping me and Pearl. <laughs> well, well, that's a great way to end the podcast, dude. You know how to sell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Well, thanks again, uh, Raph, and uh, you be well. Okay, we'll talk soon. Uh, you be happy holidays, and you be well. And thank you, thank you so much for having me.